right, well, how y'all doing today? Good to see you. Welcome to church. You look amazing. Um, anybody in here, you still doing your New Year's resolution? Anybody you haven't given up yet? Okay, we got three people. Praise God. Praise the Lord. The rest of you are like, no, man, that's why I'm at church, you know? Dieting didn't work, and now I'm going to prayer. Maybe try fasting. But anyway, really excited today to uh, continue our series and really wrap up our series, Wholehearted Home. We've been talking for four weeks now on how to make church not just something that we do, not just a place that we go, but how do we make it a home? How do we make it a place where I'm known by people, people know what I'm going through, and they can celebrate with me, they can cry with me, they can help me get through whatever it is that I'm going through, good or bad. And we kicked off this series four weeks ago, and uh, in week one, man, week one was really a week of celebration. We were able to share some of the things that God has done in the first three months um, of our church. If you are new, welcome, so are we. We haven't been around for that long. And uh, we shared a bunch of stories, and it was awesome. We also shared a couple exciting things. In the first three months of our church, we've had over 130 people join our team that serve. We've started over 20 small groups. We've had 114 people give their life to Jesus. And so those are all things that we are excited about. And, And really, we hear stories every week about how God is changing people's lives. People come in one way, and they leave another way. People come in with not a whole lot of hope, and they leave with more hope than they've ever had. And the only reason we share those things is not only to glorify God, but to tell you how many know God is a God who can do it again. And so if you're in here today and you need a breakthrough, be encouraged. We've seen a lot since we've started our church. If you're in here today and you say, man, I need some new community, I need some friends, I need some family, people I can do life with, be encouraged, because we've heard many stories of people finding that here. If you're in here today and you say, man, I need, some, I need some healing. I have a physical pain or some kind of emotional struggle that I'm going through. Be encouraged. We've had multiple stories of people being physically healed by God since we started our church. If you're here and you say, man, I, I got kids that are wayward, cousins or best friends that don't know God, be encouraged because we've had a lot of stories since we've started of people coming here and finding Jesus. If your spouse doesn't go to church, if your spouse doesn't know God, be encouraged We've had multiple stories in the last month of people's spouses coming to church who maybe haven't been in church for years or ever and making this a home. And so we're just here to say, hey, if you need a breakthrough, I believe it can happen for you because God is a God who does it again. He just keeps doing it. And when you, when you focus on what God has already done, it gives you faith to move forward into what God is about to do. And speaking of that, what God's about to do, really excited today to wrap up this series, Whole Hearted Home. And we thought there's no better way to wrap up the, our first series in our first year about making church a home than to have a community party. And so after the service, we're going to have all of our communities. It's the way we do small groups as a church. All of our community leaders are going to be outside, and they want to meet you, and they love for you to sign up for a community. We have over 20 communities, small groups that meet all over the city. We're also going to have food, which is going to be awesome. We announced it last week. Um, we're going to have different kinds of food outside, but the one food I'm most excited about is this thing called a salty dog. Okay, salty dog. Some of you know what it is. It doesn't sound very good, but I'm telling you, have a little faith. It's pretty good. Here's what a salty dog is. It is a hot dog with pulled pork on top of it. I think I got that right. Is that, I got that right? Yeah, there you are. Yeah, you're making them. And so um, it's amazing. It's the best hot dog I've ever had. There's other stuff outside, but, but praise the Lord, salty dogs came from the Lord. We're also going to have jumpers and things outside. And I've, been, I've been wondering, we got to get a kid's jumper, because I'm going to know we got an adult jumper. We need one of those outside. So there's going to be some fun going on after the service. And so really, the sermon today is not the main event. It's not the main thing. We tried to shave a few minutes off the service so you guys can actually stay, stick around, get to know some people, do some life together, hopefully sign up for a community, but you still have to hear me preach. Is that okay? And that's, In fact, that's how you get to lunch. You have to hear me preach for about 35 to 75 minutes. We'll see how the Lord leads, you know? But um, when we get through this, we'll get to lunch. But why don't we go ahead and open up the Bible. If you got a Bible, you can turn to Luke chapter 10. That's where we're going to be today. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to throw it up on the screen. Wow, we get fed, we get just fed twice, we just get fed all day, get fed the word, and then you get fed a salty dog, and so that's good, we keep getting fed, so we're going to open up the word, that's what we do here, we like to do that each week, we're going to throw it up uh, on the screen, Um, at this point in Luke chapter 10, the Bible indicates that Jesus has now gone to many different towns, preached the gospel, uh, prayed over people, healed the sick, and at this point, there's now people that are actually following Jesus, like it's working. I feel like there's this moment when the disciples look at each other like people are actually, they're responding like this is working. We weren't sure, but people are actually showing up. This is a really good thing. And so the Bible says there's all these people that are coming to them. They have a crowd, which is great. And so what does Jesus do? He starts sending them away. What? Yeah, he actually starts sending them out. Why? Because God is not just a God who gathers people in. He's a God who sends people out. 
Because much like in our culture, in that culture, people were not just coming to church. They weren't just showing up on Sunday. You actually had to be the church out there. How many people know sometimes we focus so much on being the church in here, we don't really think about being the church out there. That's where the people are. It's only 5% of our city that comes to church on Sunday. So Jesus, he starts sending people out. The Bible says they're going out to all these towns, they're sharing the gospel, and they're seeing God move in miraculous ways. And so they come back to Jesus after this is happening, and they do what we like to do. They just start sharing stories. They start sharing all these testimonies of how God is moving, and it's really exciting, and they're celebrating. And all of a sudden, as all of this is going on, the Bible indicates that there is an expert in the law, a religious person who's just watching. He's just standing off to the side, and he's observing. He's probably a little confused, probably a little bit offended that Jesus would send people out to serve the least of these. The widow and the orphan and the people who are ostracized from society is a little bit upset, probably. And so in an effort to test Jesus and to challenge him, the Bible says he asks him a question. And that's where we pick up the story, Luke chapter 10 in verse 25. Here's what the Bible says. It says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do? Notice the word do. What, what do I got to do to inherit eternal life? What good deeds must I do? What prayers must I pray? Jesus said, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Oh, and of course, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, you've, you've answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. And by the way, when Jesus says do this, he means do it 24-7 all the time. Be perfect, and you too can earn eternal life on your own. But he wanted to justify himself. In other words, he wanted to prove that he could. He wanted to prove that he was elevated past most people spiritually, that he was better than the people around him. He wanted to justify himself. And so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Like, how do I actually do that? Who is my neighbor? And so Jesus answers in true Jesus style. He gets a question and he responds with a story or a parable. A parable is a story that Jesus would tell in the Bible to help teach a lesson or make a point. And so we get the very famous story of the Good Samaritan. And we're going to read now verse 30. It says, In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. What I want to talk about today is a lot of this idea of being half dead. Verse 31, A priest happened to be going down the road, probably good news, except when he saw him, he passed by on the other side, trying to dodge him or get away from him. So to a Levite, who's like a priest, it's a fancy word for priest, when he came down to the place, he saw him pass by again on the other side trying to get away from him, but verse 33, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. Now the translation said he had compassion for him. He went to him, he bandaged his wounds, and he poured on him oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, he brought him to an inn to take care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, when I come back, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. He says this, Jesus, he says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the robbers? Verse 37, the expert in the life said this, the one who had mercy on him, Jesus said, go and do likewise. Amen. And amen. Hey, really excited today to wrap up this series, Wholehearted Home. How, we're talking about how to, how to be a part of the body of Christ. Because how many people know there's a difference between going to a church and being a part of a church, and attending a church, and actually being known by a church family, being a part of what is actually going on. And what I'm going to talk about today, I'm really passionate about. There's a word that I feel like God put in my heart a few weeks ago that I shared with you for this year. And, and it's this, I really believe that for some of us in our church, this is the year that loneliness ends for you. This is the year. That ends for you, whether it's physical, spiritual, or emotional, you're doing life alone, that's over. In fact, today I'm really excited to wrap up this series with a message that I've entitled, Loneliness Lies. Loneliness Lies, it, it'll lie to you. In fact, anybody in here today, you know anybody who's wildly positive? I mean like wildly positive, if they're here today you can go ahead and point at them. I mean so positive. So they're so optimistic, the glass is not half full, how negative of you, it's at least 60% full, you know? Like they're so positive, they make you feel negative, you know anybody like that? They're so positive, and they're so positive, everything's awesome all the time. 
even when things are terrible, no, things are awesome, right? And, and it gets to the point where it's kind of annoying, right? Even when something goes wrong in your life, you're like, this is so bad. They're like, no, it's great. And you're like, really? Should I punch you in the face? Would it be great then? Just me? Am I the only one that ever feels like that? Thanks, I'm alone up here. But anyway, there's people like that in our life. I mean, have you ever, have you ever really needed to complain? You ever really needed to vent and kind of just get something out, but you accidentally went to the wrong person? You know, you went to the positive person. And you went to complain to them, but no matter what you said, right, you're like, man, this is terrible. They're like, no, it's actually pretty good, you know. Like, you're like, man, can you believe it rained today? How terrible is that? Had to cancel my date hike. Isn't that awful? They're like, actually, it's great. You know, we needed the rain. Isn't it amazing how that same water turns into vapor and then goes up in the clouds and it rains again? <laughs> Isn't God amazing? And you're like, Stop! Stop it! I don't need that from you. You know, I didn't need a lecture. I just needed you to agree with me to make myself feel better, right? That's how, that's how complaining happens. You know, I believed that my whole life that I was a positive person because people to told me that. Growing up my whole life, people told me I was positive, and I believed them. I believed them until I met this one very specific person, and now I'm wondering. Now I think I'm very negative. There's this one person in my life. He's so wildly positive, he makes me feel negative. His name is Alex Erlenbush. Some of you know who he is. He's on our staff. Um, it, it, if you don't know him, you will, because he's like Red Bull in the flesh. You know, he's just like smiling all the time. And, and I never forget, man, before I met that guy, I was the positive guy. And now when something happens, I'm like, yeah, that was pretty good. He's like, really? I thought it was awesome. I'm like, why'd you have to do that? Now I'm the negative guy. I'm the negative guy, like, all the time. No matter what I do to go to him, like, man, things are terrible. He's like, no, things are pretty good, like, all the time. I'll never forget a few years ago, my wife's family gave us this smoker barbecue grill. And I had never used one of those before, and so I was really excited to use it. So what I do, I invited a bunch of people over for a barbecue. So I call Alex, and I say, hey, man, we're going to barbecue. He's like, yes, we are. And so he comes over, and it's the moment that he comes over that we realize neither one of us know how to use a smoker barbecue grill. We've never done it before. You know, I thought there would be buttons and stuff. No buttons. No buttons. And, and so we were like, man, we don't know what we're doing. People are coming over. I said, hey, maybe we should make like a plan B. You know, we should just go get some food. This is bad. He said, no, no, this. This is good. This is good. We get to learn something today. I love learning new things. Let's figure it out. So I'm like, okay. He opens up the lid. He says, where's the charcoal? And I thought, man, isn't that built in? You know, like I, I didn't know. I'd, I'd never used it before. I said, I don't have any charcoal, man. This isn't going to work out. I don't, I don't think we should do this. We should go get some food. He said, no, no, this, this is good. Let's go to the store. We'll get charcoal. So we go get charcoal. We come back. We realize we need lighter fluid. I don't have any lighter fluid. I'm like, hey, man, I don't have any lighter fluid. This is a bad plan. He's like, no, no, listen. I bet one of your neighbors has lighter fluid. We should go meet a new neighbor. So we go met like four neighbors. One of them, sure enough, had lighter fluid. And so then we come back, and we're trying to light the coals on fire thinking that that's what coals do, because we didn't know any better. And so there, we're, there we are trying to light the coals on fire. It's not working. It's not working. I'm like, man, I, I know you want to learn something, but how many know learning and being hungry? They don't go together. Like, we should just go get some food. This isn't a good plan. He said, no, man, listen, this, this is good. We should keep going. An hour and a half goes by. Nothing happens, okay? All of a sudden, everybody that was invited, they're all there, and they're all hungry, and they're wondering what's going on. We tried everything. I prayed in tongues. We read the King James out loud. Like, nothing, nothing worked, you know? I said, hey, man, listen, people are here. They're hungry. If I slip out now, I can go buy some barbecue and bring it back. They'll never know, you know? They'll never know. He said, no, man, listen, this, this is good. This is good. I feel like we're close. Let's keep trying. And so we kept trying, and a couple minutes later, somebody walks outside. They just got there. said, hey, sorry I'm late. H how's it going? I said, man, I, it's going terrible. You know, like we, we've been trying to light these coals on fire, but there's nothing that we can do. They won't stay lit. And in one moment, he says this. He says, oh, coals don't light on fire. They glow. And then he, he says, I'll see you in there. Walks away. In 10 seconds, solves all of the world's problems. We open it up. The coals had been glowing the whole time. So we threw the food on there. We cooked the food, and we had a great night. Here's the moral of the story. The moral of the story is this. I wanted to give up like seven times. I was ready to throw in the towel time and time again. And then there was trusty old Al saying, hey, man, listen, let's not give up. This is good. Let's keep pushing. Let's keep pressing. We're about to have a breakthrough. And we did. And I cannot tell you how many times in my life I've gone to him and other people in my community ready to give up, ready to give up on commitments or ideas that I've created. Say, hey, man, I think it's over. I think it's done. And time and time again, people say, hey, this isn't just good, but this is God. This is God. He's moving in this. He's teaching you something. The time is not to give up. It's to keep going. 
I can't tell you how many times I've actually wanted to walk away from Jesus early on. I said, you know what, I don't think this thing is for me. I, I don't think I'm supposed to follow him. It's not really working out. I, I think I want to walk away. And time and time again, people in my community said, no, no, listen, th- this is God. God. God has you in this season for a reason. There's something he's doing in you. Don't quit. Keep going. I can't tell you about the times when I wanted to walk away from ministry, thinking, you know what, this thing's harder than I thought it was. People aren't really happy with me. Some people hate me. I should get out while I'm young. And there's been people time and time again saying, hey, listen, this is God. God's in this. He's right here in the middle. Don't give up. Keep pushing. I think we all need somebody in our life who says that over us. We need a don't give up, this is God voice in our life. We all need that. Probably multiple, right? That, that, no, it's not time to give up, but it's time to press into what God is doing in you. We need someone to declare, you're not perfect, you're going to fall and fail, but God knew that, and he made a plan to get you there anyway. He will finish every good work that he started in you. We all need people around us who find the positives of Jesus inside of the negatives of life. We all need that. For life's not really about what happens to you, but rather how you respond to what happens to you. And if you don't have someone around you speaking truth and, and pushing you to go forward, you're going to fall, and you're going to fall really hard. Because why? You're not, you're not to be trusted on your own. I don't trust people who trust themselves too much. Right? Meaning if you think you can live life without accountability, the only thing that's on your horizon is a really hard fall. And it's coming at you faster than you think. Why? Because we're unpredictable. Right? There's no telling what dumb thing you and I will do next. You ever lay in bed at night, shocked at what you did that day? I do it all the time. Things I say to people, I'm like, I can't believe I said that. I was just trying to be nice. I was trying to be funny, and it ruined their day. And I cannot believe I did that. It happens to me all the time. We shock ourselves with how dumb that we can be. But there's people around us who, what, they turn us back, and they push us towards what's next. Why do we do that? Because we struggle. That's who we are. But thanks be to God who put a family all around us, who put people around our life who won't let us turn back. Don't turn back. You know, there's this old song that I love to sing. Um, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Why? Well, not because of me. Not because of my willpower and how good I am and how gifted that I am. Absolutely not. The truth is, I couldn't turn away from Jesus. I couldn't. It's not impossible, but it's almost Impossible, because if I did, there'd be about 20 people ready to punch me in the face. There, there, there just would be. There'd be people that lovingly would, you know, would do that in a loving way. They, they just wouldn't let me turn away from God. Left to my own devices, there's no telling what I could do. But with a church, family, and community behind me, we could do anything. You know, I'd love to sit here today and take credit for all the great things I've been able to do in my life. To be honest with you, when I was younger, I did not imagine that I would be doing this. I didn't imagine my life would be this big and, and, and this fun and this blessed And I only say that to say this, I wish I could take credit for it, but I can't. I can't. When I look back at the things in my life that turned out, each thing was like, I didn't want it, and I tried to run away. I didn't want to go to the place where I met my wife eventually. I I didn't want to go to to be involved in the thing where I met my best friends and God called me to do it. I didn't want any of it. But somehow there were people who corralled me back in. You know, it's it's when I find myself alone. That's when I fall the hardest. It's when I find myself thinking on things by myself. I keep things a secret. I'm trying to deal with it internally. That's when I fall the hardest, when I'm by myself. And that's where this guy finds himself. He finds himself all alone in the story in Luke 10. You know, in Luke 10, it says there's a man who walks down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And don't you know, that's actually a real road. It's a real place. It's a very busy road that was used all the time. It'd be kind of like Highway 5. With people on it constantly, merchants and traders and, and families and individuals. And if you do a little research, you find out that that road was actually pretty dangerous. And so you should not travel on that road by yourself because there are people waiting. There were bandits and robbers who would wait for the shade of night to jump out and, and jump people and rob them and steal from them. It was known to be a road that beat people down. And isn't that the road of life? Life has proved to be exceptionally difficult time and time again. How often have you been simply walking down the road of life, minding your own business, going from one place to another, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you get ambushed. You get robbed. You get jumped by life. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, you lost your job. A loved one left or passed away. Your car broke down. It can happen out of nowhere. But the problem is if you're walking alone, who is there to pick you up? If there's nobody, you're probably just going to stay down. This guy had no backup. He was traveling alone. Do you really have community? Do you really have backup? 
People who, by the way, they don't just pick you up, but they bring you back to Jesus. That's how you know you have a good friend. They don't just pick you up. They actually bring you back to God because there will be times in your life where life is so painful and so hard, you feel paralyzed spiritually. Where you don't think that you can actually take yourself back to God. You need others to do that. Who have faith for you when you do not have faith for yourself. And so ask yourself this question. How easy is it for you to walk away from God? How easy is it for you? Not just, you know, you stop believing in God, but I'm saying like with, with things you look up on your devices or your computer that you shouldn't look up, things that you spend money on that you shouldn't spend money on, how much of that stuff is secretive in your life? Is it hard to walk away from that, away from God? Listen, if it is, friend, you need some new friends. You need some new influences in your life. And I'll tell you this, I probably could never walk away from ministry even if I wanted to, but not because of me, but because of you. I've shared too many things. I'm a big mouth. You know, I've shared too many visions and, 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 and dreams and like what God's called me to do. It's like I, I couldn't walk away because I've shared it with too many people and they're my strength. They, they hold me up when I want to walk away. And so who's in your corner? Who's pushing you? Who's challenging you where you're at? Be around them. Do not get caught in this fight alone because you won't make it. Don't get caught in isolation. I like to say this a lot. When in isolation, problems seem bigger than they really are. The devil seems greater than he really is. Pain seems a lot bigger than it really is. When you're isolated, you find yourself half dead. Half dead. And that's what it says in the story. And by definition, I, I believe this. Spirit, to be spiritually half dead is to be alive on the outside, but dead on the inside. Things seem like they're good on the outside, but on the inside, you, you're not feeling it. You're not feeling alive. You need some help. And here's the sad reality about church and about life is there's people walking around you all over the place, who are dead on the inside, you'd never know it. You'd never know it. They're walking right by you. I mean, you look at their Instagram, they look good. Their hair looks good every day, you know. They do fun things. They're... But you'd never know how they feel on the inside. I'll never forget my first week of college, okay, several, several, several years ago. We won't say how many years ago. Several years ago, it was my first year of college at San Diego State. I went to San Diego State because I was poor, but I loved it. I had a really good time. I had a really good time. But my first week of college, I'll never forget I went, and it was a big deal. It's like, wow, we're in college. And so I had a friend from church. He came down. He said, I want to take you out to lunch. I want to congratulate you and all that. And so it was the third day of school. He comes down, and he picks me up in front of one of the biggest dorms on campus. And so I hop in the car, and before we drive away, I look out, and there's thousands of new kids. And I had this thought, like, man, they're all going through what I'm going through. It's exciting. It's a new thing. They're trying to find new friends. And so I had this crazy thought just pop in my head. I mean, have you ever heard somebody tell you, don't get in a car with strangers? Have you ever heard that? I did the exact opposite, okay? I was about to ask a stranger to get in the car with me. I looked at my friend. I said, hey, before we go to lunch, I want to recruit somebody to go to lunch with us that we don't know. And so I look over about 20 feet away. There's this kid standing all by himself, not walking anywhere, just listening to music. And so I yell at him, hey, you, hey, you. And so he turns, and he does that thing, you know, that people do. He turns, and he sees me staring at him. So he looks away, you know, for like five to seven seconds. And then he looks back to see if they're still staring. And guess who was still staring? I was still staring at him. And I said, hey, you, get over here. You know, and he's like, who, me, her, him? He tried to dodge it. And I said, no, you, you, you need to walk. And so he starts walking towards me. And he does that thing, you know, he's like walking and he's like trying to stare at me on the way. Like, do I know him? Do I know him? And then he realizes, yeah, I don't know him. He's a total stranger. <laughs> and he gets to the car and is what he says. Starts off really great. He said, hey, who the F are you? Stop yelling at me. That's what he said. Started off awesome, right? And, um, and this is what I said. I said, hey, my name is Wes. This is my friend. We're going to lunch. Get in the car. That's all I said. He looks around. He gets in the car. Yeah, yeah he got in the car. Yeah, and looking back, I don't know what was creepier. The two guys asked the guy to get in the car or that he actually did it. I'm not sure, but he did. And so, and so then we go to lunch. We go to lunch, and 30 minutes at lunch turned into two hours, and we're telling stories. We're getting to know each other, and this guy's cool. He's funny. He's, he's totally normal. It's awesome. We're just having a good time, and the feeling of the room is we're laughing. It's good, and then all of a sudden, okay, about two hours into it, all of a sudden, it gets really serious, real serious. He says, guys, I have to tell you something, and at this point, we're like, whoa, is he a murderer? You know, like, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know anything about this guy. He says, i got to tell you something. This was a really big deal that you asked me to come to lunch. We're like, dude, no big deal, man. It was awesome. You know, you're cool. We should do it again. He says, no, really, it was a big, it was a big deal. He said, you see, I've, I've never been asked 
to go get a meal with somebody from school. First time. I said, man, why are you being so hard on yourself? Third day of school, okay? Like, I said, you'll make friends. You know, you're totally cool. He said, no, no, you don't understand. I'm not a freshman. I'm a junior. I've been here for two years, and I have yet to make a friend close enough to go get a meal with. And I'm telling you, I was shocked. I was shocked. It's like, this guy's normal. He's cool. I mean, once you get past the hard shell, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, cussing me out. Like, once you get past that, he was cool. Yeah. Once you get past the whole, like, hey, I don't need you. Get away from me. I'm fine on my own. I'm strong. When you get past all of that, which we usually don't, but when you get past all that, he was cool, and he was totally normal. I mean, he had a hard shell, but you come to find out that he was absolutely dying on the inside. But here's what I thought. Nobody would ever know it because he was wearing a mask. Consider how many people come through your world at church, in your office, in your neighborhood, and they seem great, but they're half dead. They're dead on the inside, but you would never even know it. They seem good when you look at their stuff online, but then you realize, man, that they need, a, they need help, they need a home, they need people that care about them. I've learned as I do ministry that often what people project on the outside is contradictory to what is happening on the inside. It's usually opposite, and they don't really coincide. And the truth is, a lot of us in here today, you're, you're lonely. You're lonely. And it breaks my heart because just as I say the word lonely, it triggers something in you. Some kind of pain, some, some kind of empty feeling inside. It, it's pain and the emotion of being alone. And, and, and listen, it doesn't matter where you are, what you do. I, I, know, I know single people who are lonely. I know married people who are lonely. I know unsuccessful people who are lonely. I know very successful, rich people who are very, very lonely. Why? Because loneliness has much less to do with what's happening on the outside. It has much more to do with what's going on on the inside. That even in a room today, as we go do food, in a room of hundreds of people, you feel like you're by yourself. And what you need to understand today is that loneliness will lie to you. It'll tell you, if this is the way your life is, it's always going to be this way. If you're single now, you're always going to be single. If your marriage is hard now, it's probably always going to be hard. If you haven't found lifelong friends to do life with yet, you've probably missed it. If you haven't found a mentor or a fatherly, motherly figure in your life to pour into you, it's probably not going to happen. And listen, I got a lot of one-liners and stuff, but I just got to tell you, that's just from hell, man. It's just from hell. It's not, it's not from God. That's not God's plan for your life. You know, that, that wildly positive spirit that I talked about, that Alex has and some of you have, that comes from God. Did you know God is a wildly positive God? When you, when you read the Bible in Genesis, you find that he makes things and he says, hey, this is good. He made the heavens, it was good. He made the earth, it was good. He made the land and the sea, it was good. He made the animals, it was good. And then he makes Adam. He says, this is good. This is good. And then all of a sudden, for the first time in the history of the world that we know of up until that point, God says a phrase he'd never said before. In Genesis 3.18, he looks at Adam, and he says, Adam, you're good, but, but you're alone, and that's not good. That's not good. That's not how I made you. That's not what I want for you. It's actually not how I designed you. You're not supposed to be alone. Why? Because did you know that God has never been alone? Never. From the origination of God, as far as we know, He is Father, Son, and Spirit. And when you, when you have an internal need to belong or to be a part of something, you are expressing God in you. Because God has never been alone. He is, he's never been alone. He's always had a family. That's, it's who He is. It's a definition, one of the definitions of many of God. He, he is family. When you have this need emotionally, with your purpose, spiritually, physically, to be with somebody, that's just God being expressed through you because our need to not be alone, it, it, it comes from him. But loneliness will tell you that's just who you are. That's just your life, man. That's just the way that it is. But can I tell you today, it's just not what God has for you. You have to be you and be the real you. Because we can't love someone that you're trying to, but be you. The you that God made doesn't want to be alone. But the problem is that's hard. It's hard to be real. It's hard to open up. Have you ever noticed? It's kind of easy sometimes to be alone. It is. Why? Because we have this fear of what happened to the man on the road. The Bible says that this guy gets beaten and he's struggling. And who walks by to help? Some religious people. That's like the worst person that you want to talk to when things are going hard. The religious person. Right? They, they don't want to hug you. They want to lecture you. They want to fix you and then diagnose you because they have all the answers. This is how a lot of people feel in church. This is why a lot of people aren't in church. 
to be honest. They don't want to come and have this experience. The problem is we'll always be alone until we open up, but it's hard to open up. Why? Because church is becoming something it was never supposed to be. And we talked about this two weeks ago, and I promised I would talk about it today, and it's this. Church is becoming less of a rehab and more of a resort, and that's not what it was ever supposed to be. This is supposed to be a place where people who are going through stuff are in pain and they're struggling. They're supposed to come here and be welcomed here. You're supposed to be able to open up, and it's okay. Listen, by the way, not that we coddle issues, you know? Like, oh, you're addicted. It's okay. Just give me a hug. It's fine. You can just be addicted. We don't don't do that because our second value as a church is freedom. Jesus doesn't come to coexist with other issues. He comes to drive them out. But how many know Jesus has never lost a battle? He's victorious, and so we, we pray over those things. But that moment never happens unless we can be real and open up until it comes into the light, until someone makes a decision, I'm going to be a part of this. I'm going to be in this community, and I'm going to be the real me. It's not until you make that decision that you can get help and get healing, but there's a lot of pressure to keep it in and act like it's not there. Why? Because church is becoming more of a dance recital rather than a hospital. It's supposed to be a hospital. There's a story touched on a few weeks ago. Matthew chapter 9, speaking of a hospital, the Bible says that Jesus is at a raging party doesn't say he was at a raging party. It just says who was there at this raging party. There was prostitutes and and tax collectors, which back then was like organized crime and gangsters and all that. And Jesus is there too. Kind of weird. And he's there and he's hanging out and they're having a good time. And the Bible says that there's some religious people watching. Have you ever noticed that religious people like to watch? It's just an interesting. They're just observing, you know, innocently. And um, as they're observing, they get upset. What kind of religion is this, Jesus? Are you really representing God? This is no good. Why are you hanging out with those people? And then Jesus says something in Matthew 9. It's one of the most important things he ever says. He says, hey, listen up, church people. I have something to tell you. I love you. I came for you. But I didn't only come for you. I actually came for sick people. Believe it or not, I actually came for people who knew that they need me because that's what defines somebody who's sick. They know that they need a doctor. Sick people need a doctor. He says, I'm kind of like a doctor. That's what he says. And I think we think God will will judge us for being sick. That's not what he does. That's not what a doctor judge you for being sick. Hopefully not. Wouldn't be a doctor for very long. I wouldn't go to them. You know, it's like that's not what doctors do, right? Doctors don't shrug and freak out at, at, at our condition. You know who does that? Church people can do that, though. You did what? With who? Where? Oh, no. <laughs> wow. We'll pray for you, you know, I don't know. We'll see what happens, but I'm not really sure what God can do with all of that. There's this feeling and this, like, propensity inside of us to do that when we hear about people doing stuff. We see stuff on social media. You see famous, but they're like, we try to get as far, we try to get on the other side and get as far away from it as we can. Why? And here's why I think we do that. I think when, when we have a swift judgment of other people's sin, we believe that we look holier in the eyes of God. When in actuality, you only look holier in the eyes of you. And in the eyes of God, you just look more religious and unloving. Now you're in the way. Now you are in the way for God to heal somebody. You know what you become? You're like the people in Matthew 9. Jesus had it. He's like, do you guys remember this word mercy? Do you remember that? He had to remind them of mercy. What's the lesson? Don't be those people. Don't be them. Don't be the people Jesus has to remind about why he came. Why he came. He's the doctor, not us. You know who we're supposed to be? We're like the doctor's assistant. You know, like people come into the, the hospital like, hey, good to see you. We connect them. We get their name. We get to find out who they are. We give them some coffee, maybe a lollipop, maybe a salty dog. And we walk them back and we say what? We say, hey, Jesus is coming. Dr. J is on the way. Get excited. <laughs> Sometimes, though, we like to grab the clipboard and we start assessing people. Well, Well, (laughs) I don't know about you. You've done a lot. I'm not sure what we can do. You might be a bad influence around here. I'm not sure. And then the doctor walks in, and he says, hey, can I do my job? Like, Jesus would love to relieve us of the duty of diagnosing people's spiritual condition. He would love to have his job back. Why? Because he's, he's a father, and he's a dad, and he would like to love people all the way to getting healing. He's not, he's not going to be here to, to, to blast you and to punish you. He's a, he's a dad. Meaning what? If you struggle, you're welcome here. I'd like to make an announcement. If you struggle, you can struggle here. If you're an unbeliever, you're welcome here. You're welcome here. You can come. 
I think God is okay with it. I think so. I think so. He, he would love to bring people closer. He wants to lead people back home. Lead people back home. See, people have a pressure to not open up to who they really are. But listen, if you'll never see the privilege of someone being healed until you're first willing to hear what's going on. We have to let Jesus meet people where they're at. On the side of the road, in a ditch, we have to let Jesus meet people there. Or he's not going to meet anybody. We, we have a, a propensity to move away from people in pain. But religion moves you away from hurting people. Jesus pushes us towards hurting people. It's who he is. In fact, I believe the story of the Good Samaritan, and I, I promise I'll end with this because we're hungry. I believe the story of the Good Samaritan. Normally I hear it preaches. It, it's a good example for us. We should be the Good Samaritan. And I, I believe that along this line. that we, It is a good example for us because Jesus is the greatest example for us. And what I mean by that is this. I believe this is a picture of Jesus bringing people to church. That's what I think that this story is. The Samaritan is the unexpected one. Nobody would have expected him to come like that. Jewish listeners would have been shocked. The, the Samaritan... They were racially pushed out. They're like, they're weird, they're half-breeds, let's get them out. He was the most unexpected savior possible. So what, what happens? Religion passes by because religion can't save you. And the Samaritan comes, and here's what it says. We're going to read again. Luke 10, verse 33. It says, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, and he bound up his wounds, and he poured on oil in wine. Wine, why? Well, just a thought of that I have. I think wine because in the New Testament, wine represents the blood of Jesus that came and cleansed us and, and pushed out our pain and pushed out our past. And oil, why? Because oil represents the Holy Spirit in the Bible to come comfort us and lead us back home. Comes to lead us back home. It says, says this, then he set him on his own animal. They traded places. Did you know that Jesus came down to take your place and trade places with you. He took the punishment that we deserve. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Jesus became sin so that you and I could become the righteousness of God. God knew that he had to treat Jesus like us so that he could treat us like Jesus. That we could become children. We could come back home to dad. And it says he brought him to an inn to take care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii so he could pay for him. He paid for him. He paid for him. He paid for him. He paid the wages the man could not pay for himself because life had robbed him and left him in a ditch. And he gave him to the innkeeper saying, take care of him. And whatever you spend, I'll repay when I come back. Who's coming back? Jesus is coming back. In fact, he says in John 14, 3, he says, I'm going to leave right now because I'm going to go prepare a home for you so that when I come back, I can take you with me so that you can be where I am. Jesus meets this man like he met me, broken, beaten down on the side of the road. And what I've noticed in ministry, this is often how Jesus meets people. Have you noticed? I mean, it's very rare that somebody says, you know, I got the bonus and the raise. I bought the house and the yacht. I have more friends than ever. You know what? Now's the time. I should give my life to Jesus. It almost never happens that way. Almost never. You know, I just, I just need to give my life and the control of it to somebody else. I mean, this doesn't usually happen like that. Jesus often meets people like he met me in an emotional ditch on the side of the road all alone, which speaks to who Jesus came for. He does not wait for this man to figure it out. He doesn't wait for you to figure it out and say, you know what, they're pretty good. That's a good candidate for my church. He doesn't say that. He doesn't do that. He came to put the lonely in a family. He's not turned off by your pain. He's attracted to it. It, it doesn't turn him away from you. It actually turns him towards you. Which is not how we act a lot of the time. I, I see people sin, sleeping with whoever, doing this, doing that. We see it on it's like you see it, and I, and I often see all that as an obstacle to God. I think Jesus doesn't see an obstacle; he sees an opportunity. This is an opportunity to put the lonely in a family. They don't know who they are yet. Maybe we can go find them and put them in a family. It says he took this man to an inn on that road. By the way, these inns were really popular because they were needed. As, as the shade of night came, people would often get jumped. And so there was these little inns that started popping up out of, all over the place. So people could take refuge, come get rested, get some covering. And, and I don't know, what, what kind of inn do you think that it was? Was it a Marriott? Was it a Radisson? 
You think it was the Ritz-Carlton? I don't know. I don't know. I'm wondering what kind of inn this was. And I could be wrong, but I just have a thought today that if I went to the Marriott Resort and I was bleeding and I was in trauma and I needed help and I said, hey, can you take care of me? Can anybody here nurse me back to health? I probably wouldn't get let in. And so it might be a crazy thought. I just think this inn was less of a resort. I think it was more of a rehab. I don't think it was a hotel. I think it was a hospital where people came in and they were struggling and they were welcome. They were going through a lot and they said, hey, can you stay? We'd love for you to stay. It's a good place for you to be. But I love the charge the Samaritan gives the innkeeper. He says, just take care of him. Take care of him. Just, just take care of him. And if you're like me, I want to ask questions. But what, who are they? How did they get here? Where are they at in life? Are they a believer? Are they going to be a bad influence? On our, who are they? And he's like, just take care of them. Just take care of them. But what do they believe? Just take care of them. Just take, just take care of them. Who did they vote for? No, nope. just, just take care of them. What's their sexual orientation? Just take care of them. You just take care of them. It's okay. Just take care of it. And my hope and prayer is that we could be a church full of communities all over the city that have this same charge. That we would be close to the path of life because newsflash, God doesn't just work on Sunday. He works every day of the week. I believe Sunday is the day of rest where we could come, worship God, eat a salty dog, praise Him, and then get fired up and go do the real work Monday through Saturday, which is where communities are, close to the path of life, close to where people actually are, where you have people in your life who can walk through it with you. Because God said to be alone, that's, that's not a good thing. God made a lot of good things. He didn't make loneliness. That's why I lies to you, because it's from the devil. It's not from God, and it's not his plan for your life. And so we send communities out all over the city to take care of people until Jesus comes back. And I believe the promise. What did he say to the guy? He said, anything you pay extra, I'll pay you back. I'll pay you back. I'll reward you when I get back. What's the lesson? Don't be alone. Don't be alone. Be in community. Would you pray with me? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I want to pray for some people in here today.